Okay, maybe let's get started. Uh, let's have Professor Sancio continue his um, lecture on the um, topology, topology and correlation in memory graphing materials. Please go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you, Shomeng. Thank you all for coming, coming for coming back. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you fine. All right, very good. Let me pick, off, uh, pick up where I left off. Uh, so, uh, so in my last slide, I made the point that in many, uh, you know, twisted barrier graphene is very special amongst these different Moira materials because uh, like first it has this extra C2 symmetry, which uh, guarantees this band touching of uh, conduction valence bands and air points and so on. Um, in many of these other Moira graphene systems, you don't have that symmetry, so conduction valence bands are split off from each other. And the band topology is of a particularly simple and familiar form, which is that you get nearly flat churn bands, one for each valley, and the churn number for the two different values is and also the two values are related by time inversely. So I gave a number of examples of uh, uh, Moira graphene systems where you get these plus minus churn bands. So I want to illustrate this with one example. Uh, the cells come from on the band topology, so that within this model you get the uh, same week that Pablo's first papers appeared in Nature. Uh, so, uh, so it's been a, a system of interest right from day one. So ABC trilayer graphene has three layers of graphene where any uh, each below and above it. Right? So it's this kind of stacking. Um, and you align it with a boron nitride substrate on one side and a slight lattice measurement uh, by independently controlling both VB and VT, uh, they, they could apply a perpendicular displacement field, uh, a perpendicular electric field to the sandwich that uh, is denoted D. Um, now band structure wise, uh, uh, you know, the alignment with the boron nitride breaks the C2 symmetry. So there's no C2T symmetry in the system. And so we expect a single isolated band per spin per valley. Now, a dramatic thing that was uh, uh, you know, demonstrated in these experiments by Feng is that uh, he could control the bandwidth of the system by tuning the strength of the perpendicular displacement field. So essentially using gate voltages, he was able to tune the bandwidth in such a way as to control the strength of the correlation of X. So the idea is that you're changing the bandwidth, but you don't change the strength of the Coulomb interaction by changing this perpendicular electric field D. And therefore, the ratio of bandwidth to Coulomb energy can be controlled electrically. Okay, And this plot has a nice demonstration of this. So in this plot, uh, varying along the diagonal direction, uh, varying along this diagonal direction, corresponds to changing the displacement field at fixed carrier concentration, while varying in this diagonal direction corresponds to keeping the displacement field fixed while changing the carrier concentration, okay? And C and P is marked here. So this is charge neutrality. And a charge neutrality, you get, uh, so the bright colors means high resistance. So you get a resistive state at charge neutrality. Now, if you dope into the valence band, if you decrease the charge carriers and go in this direction, I don't know if you can see my mouse very well, but if you uh, concentrate really hard, you can do that. Uh, so if you go towards the, you know, the left bottom corner of this uh, uh, rectangle, uh, then your- uh, You can see your mouse just fine, so. You can, you can see my mouse fine, thank, thank you. So then uh, you're, you're doping into the valence pack. And let's say you're at half filling of the valence band, and you see that uh, uh, at zero displacement field, uh, the system is metallic. Okay, so so bright colors means high resistance, uh, indicative of an insulator, and it's dark here. So it's uh, and it, uh, you can look at the data uh, itself, and it looks metallic. Now, as you increase the displacement field at fixed filling, 
you enter a correlated enslaver, right? So this is wonderful because you're able to easily, with electrical controls, tune in and out to the correlated enslaver phase. Indeed, this kind of tunability is one of the huge advantages of these uh, 2D materials in general, and in particular, uh, these correlated 2D materials. Uh, so here, this uh, ABC tie layer is a beautiful example of uh, this ability to tune correlations relative to bandwidth uh, very easily, okay? Uh, so when we looked at the band structure of the system, uh, what we realized is that for one sign of uh, uh, this displacement field D, each value filtered band has a non-zero turn number, which according to band theory is plus minus three. And I'll give you a simple understanding of this later. Uh, well, for the opposite sign of D, these value filtered bands have turn number zero, okay? Um, uh, so though the turn number zero, it turns out there is a non-zero very flux density, it's just that the integral of the very flux density is zero, okay? Now you could ask what determine, what breaks the symmetry between positive D and negative D? And the point is that your, your trilayer system is aligned with the boron nitride substrate only on one side. So clearly there is no symmetry between the changing the sign of D, okay? Uh, so the two signs of D can certainly behave differently. But now you see- Perfect, thank you. Uh, there is a question from the audience. Uh, how, to yeah. see the, how to see that the displacement field controls the bandwidth? Uh, so you can just do the band structure, right? No, uh, so I'm, in my slides, I don't, I, I don't give you, a, I didn't prepare a slide with a simple explanation for why this controls the band structure, but the, uh, the bandwidth, but the sort of essential point is that for one sign of D, the electrons tend to stick to the bottom most layer uh, and thereby feel the HBN potential very strongly. While for the other, you know, uh, as you control the strength of the, the strength of D, the extent to which the electrons stick to that bottom most layer changes. And so the sensitivity of the electron to the boron nitride potential is changing. Right? That's the underlying reason why there's an effect on the bandwidth at all. And that's it's also the uh, this also the reason why there's this asymmetry, because for the other sign of D, electrons tend to stick to the layer that's furthest away from the side where it's aligned. Um, but you know. There's a one electron effect, so you can just calculate it and uh, you, you can see that you get a big control, that, that it's possible to get good control of the bandwidth. Okay. Uh, so the wonderful thing is that not only can you control the correlation effects by controlling the bandwidth, but since, so the magnitude of D controls the strength of correlation effects relative to bandwidth, and the sign of D controls band topology. So in the same system with electrical controls, you're able to control both correlation effects and band topology and turn one off or, uh, you know, turn either one off or on uh, depending on what you do, right? So that's an amazing capability uh, in, in the system and in other related systems that you know, should enable all kinds of amazing experiments uh, and some of which will be being done. Okay, so let's understand where these churn numbers and so on come from. Uh, yeah. So many of you probably know, all of you know that monolayer graphene as a single, uh, as a linear Dirac point, Dirac band touching uh, in balance and conduction bands. Uh, Bilayer graphene, you know, Bernal stack bilayer graphene has to a good approximation a quadratic band touching. Uh, now, likewise, uh, you know, ABC trilayer graphene with no alignment to boron nitride has a cubic band touching to a good approximation. So let's take the model. Uh, uh, let's take a sim simplified model for uh, this cubic band touching of ABC trilayer graphene. Uh, it's very analogous to the story with monolayer or bilayer graphene. So you have a purely off-diagonal uh, kx minus i ky uh, uh, cubed term on this diagonal and a kx plus i ky cubed on this diagonal. Now, the uh, 
so so this two by two matrix so at low energies what happens is that the hopping between the two two neighboring graphene layers is very strong so the effectively at low energies in the style layer structure you can build a two band model which only focuses on electrons in the bottom layer and the top layer right so that effective model looks uh, has this off diagonal cubic band touching terms uh, now if you turn on a vertical electric field then you introduce a potential difference between the top layer and the bottom layer this shows up as a diagonal term in this 2 by 2 matrix which uh, looks like a mass term it has opposite signs uh, uh, in this corner and in this corner okay now with the cubic band touching there is a 3 pi berry phase as you go around the band touching point uh, so there's a huge amount of berry curvature that in the absence of this diagonal mass is concentrated at the band touching points. Now, what the mass term does is it, it spreads out that very curvature uh, in the vicinity of the band touching points, but it's no longer a delta function very curvature. Okay, there's a small region uh, in K space around this band touching point where this very curvature is spread out. Um, but this very curvature is opposite uh, for opposite values. Okay, so normally in normal uh, ABC stack trilayer graphene in a perpendicular electric field, uh, the two microscopic valleys of the graphene layers are connected to the bottom of the band. So the net very curvature of the full band will include that coming from the vicinity of both K and K, microscopic K and K prime points. And since they have opposite very curvature, they would normally cancel to give a net churn number of zero, okay? So that's sort of the standard story uh, without the Moire potential. Now, what the Moire potential does is to detach the mini band near each valley from the rest of the spectrum, right? So the two valleys now are no longer connected through the bottom of the band because there's no gap to the remote bands, to the fully filled bands, right? So once there's a gap, uh, so then, uh, so once you have this, then the turn number of each mini band, which lives near the vicinity of one, which lives within one valley, that turn number is well defined. Okay, and now you have a contribution. Uh, the, the change in the Berry curvature uh, between the two signs of D is uh, precisely equal to uh, three pi, right? So the change. Uh, in the, when you change the sign of D, the change in the churn number between the, uh, let's say the valence band uh, in one valley should be plus or minus three. Um, now this argument only tells you, gives you the change of the churn number. Of course, since the churn number of each mini band is well-defined, uh, the contribution to the churn number from the region near the nearly band touch region of the below zone must be compensated by contributions from regions further away to give you uh, an integer churn number. But since the change must be plus minus three, it follows that at least for one sign of D, the churn number must be non-zero. Now you can do a detailed calculation and, and what that calculation reveals is that the churn number is zero for one sign of D and is plus minus three for the other sign of D. And this plus minus corresponds to the two microscopic valleys, which have equal and opposite churn number. Okay. So you can plot the Berry flux distribution. Uh, uh, so in these plots, the HBN is assumed to be on top, and 5B is the energy difference, the potential difference between the top and bottom layer introduced by the perpendicular displacement field. Um, uh, on the left is a plot. Uh, for a sign of D where, or 5B, where the churn number is zero. And uh, so in this plot, the color scheme is such that blue means negative Berry curvature and red means positive Berry curvature. And then you see that uh, there's, you know, there's regions of blue and regions of red. And you can believe that the, when you integrate the Berry curvature over the full zone, you get zero. Now on the plot on the right, the scale has changed. Um, everything is positive. 
And you see this regions of blue and this regions of red, but here, blue and red both are positive Berry curvature. And so the integral of this Berry curvature over the full zone is non zero. And uh, uh, you, in fact, get a churn number of three. So this illustrates this uh, difference between the two signs of D, but it also illustrates this feature that even when the churn number is zero, locally in momentum space, the Berry curvature is non zero. It's just that the integral of the Berry curvature is zero. Okay. Anyway, so that's uh, the story here. So, so now we see that for one sign of D, then each valley filtered band is zero churn number, uh, has, sorry, has non zero churn number. Uh, for reason that I explained in the previous talk, you cannot construct valley symmetric one year functions. So you can't describe the system usefully through a lattice model. On the other hand, for the opposite sign of D, where the valley filtered bands have churn number zero, you can check that there's no other band topology in the system. So then you can carry through the standard program and you can construct localized one year functions and you know, write down a lattice extended Hubbard type model. So there is one feature of this model that I want to draw attention to because that's important for some of the physics. Even though you can construct localized one year functions in this case, where the churn number is zero, um, because there's a non zero Berry flux density, right? So the Berry flux density is non zero. Because of that, uh, uh, these one year functions cannot be made arbitrarily uh, narrow. They are still fat uh, due to the, uh, no, I mean, th that's the way in which the system knows about the non zero Berry flux density. In a tight, when you make a tight binding model, you know the one year functions are somewhat extended. They're somewhat fat, and uh, uh, and that just it's sort of trying to tell you that the limit in which the churn number is actually non zero, so the Berry curvature integrates to non zero, that you cannot that the fatness becomes infinitely fat. That the localization is lost. Here it's still localized because the churn number is zero, but the non zero flux density means that there is some width to the one year functions. Okay, uh, so, so that was an illustration. So the general story is that for many of these flat band Moire systems, the problem, the theoretical problem that you need to understand is that of a partially filled topological band uh, with strong correlations. But this by no means generally true for all these Moire systems. So as I just described in the previous slide, for one sign of D in this ABC trilayer graphene on HBN, it is possible to describe it in the, within the standard framework of lattice covered models. But uh, for most of these uh, flat band Moiré systems, uh, the bands have band topology. And then there's a completely new kind of uh, theoretical question that we need to attack. So we could ask, you know, given that the Lando level is a special case of a churn band, is it is this system similar to Lando levels? You know, to what extent is it actually similar to correlated partially filled Lando levels? Is that a better starting point? And the answer is we don't know completely yet, but uh, it may be a better starting. It, it certainly is a better starting point. But is this a completely useful starting point? Perhaps. The, but there are differences from Lando level physics as well, which could change the behavior in this system. I mean, the most glaring difference is that these Moiré systems microscopically are time reversal symmetric, right? Well, the Lando level obviously breaks time reversal. So it's roughly like a system with two sets of Lando levels, uh, you know, corresponding to two valleys, uh, which can, and one set of Lando levels is uh, corresponds to a magnetic field of plus B, the other set to a magnetic field of minus B. Uh, to get, taken together, this system is time reversal invariant. And then these two land levels are coupled together by interactions. So if you wanted to make an analogy, the analogy is with this kind of uh, coupled land levels with uh, one with pairs of land levels littered by time reversal symmetry, rather than to an ordinary quantum ball system. Okay, so we still have work to do. And the second difference is that even when there are churn bands, like in many of these C two broken systems. Uh, the very curvature is not uniform within the Villon zone, uh, unlike in the Lander level, where the very curvature is absolutely flat. 
And finally, the bandwidth is not zero, unlike, again, unlike the random level. Uh, and furthermore, as we just saw, the bandwidth can be tuned with knobs like displacement field or perhaps with knobs like pressure, as uh, you know, Jankowitz and Dean and so on demonstrated in twisted by layer graphene and so on and so forth. So there are all these differences, and we don't, a priori, it's not clear which one of these will affect the physics or affect any particular phenomenon that we see in the system. So it's good to be careful and not jump up and down and say, look, this just won't fall. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, of all the previous problems that uh, have been solved in quantum current matter physics, intuition from quantum hall is probably the least likely to misguide. Okay, I have two negatives here that quite deliberately. Uh, uh, in doing something else, like uh, starting from some more conventional thing, uh, Maybe misguide, may misguide us, right? And starting from quantum hall, intuition from quantum hall, but keeping these differences in mind, we may have a chance of going somewhere that's not completely on the wrong track, right? So it may be a valuable starting point. So if you're trying to do theory on this system, probably a sensible thing to do is. Uh, to keep quantum hall in mind and try to incorporate some of these other aspects of the physics and see where one lands, uh, rather than starting from something like uh, uh, cube rate physics or something else. Okay. Um, so the overall comment is that these Moria systems are really different. Uh, uh, so I wish I thought of this comment, but uh, the slogan is actually from Boskaran. Uh, uh, it, the missed opportunity. This captures so perfectly uh, the, the, uh, the conclusion that I'm trying to emphasize in these talks. So the kind of physics problem that uh, we are invited to solve by all these experiments, it's a conceptually new challenge for quantum many body physics. It forces us uh, in an experimental context to think about the, the meeting of the two most fertile areas of modern quantum condensed matter physics, namely strong correlation and topological bands. And framework, uh, uh, you know, what sort of theoretical framework exists to address this kind of problem, right? So that's really the, from a broad perspective, you know, that to me, that's what's most exciting about uh, these Moray systems, uh, trying to come to grips with uh, strong correlations in this kind of topological setting, okay? Uh, all right, so next I want to talk about uh, uh, some low hanging fruit, uh, you know, so this is the big challenge. Uh, so I want to describe to you some of the easy statements that, I mean, relatively easy statements that one can make theoretically and the extent, and, and then discuss the extent to which they're supported by existing experiments, right? It seems like at least in some limits, we can come to grips with this challenge, uh, in some simple limits, come to grips with this challenge and confront theory against experiment and uh, check that our understanding is on the right track before we move on to more complex aspects of the phenomenology and uh, equally complex aspects of the theoretical modeling. Okay, again, for a school, this is all I want to do. Uh, I'm not going to speculate on uh, things that, uh, uh, I'm not going to give you any of my speculations on what may actually be going on, say, with super connectivity and twisted by layer graphene or any such thing like that. Okay, so let's talk about many body physics and the nearly flat bands. Uh, so as a reasonable starting point, uh, we might try to understand uh, what happens if we project the Coulomb attraction U to within the active bands, which we assume, which we, whose bandwidth I denote by W. Now, there's two limits in which one can try to solve the problem first as a theorist. Uh, the obvious easy and easy limit is the weak coupling limit where W is much bigger than U. And you know, at partial band filling, you basically expect a Fermi liquid metal, and perhaps with some very weak instabilities, and there are a number of papers discussing this limit. 
Though I should point out one thing that people perhaps should worry about a bit more than they have worried about so far in discussing the weak coupling limit, which is about the effect of berry phases on the uh, on the Fermi liquid itself and its instabilities at weak coupling. So that perhaps there's nothing new there, but it's still something that uh, I think is worth thinking carefully about. And so what I'm going to do instead is to talk about the opposite strong coupling limit, where U is much bigger than W. Now, of course, the real experiments in most of these materials, like in most of solid state physics, is in an interesting regime where neither of these two limits is actually uh, accurate. It's where U is probably comparable to W, right? Um, but nevertheless, you know, as a theorist, uh, let's do the simpler things first and understand both these two limits. Okay, so let's think about U much bigger than W. And let me focus on total band fillings of uh, 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 one, two, or three. Um, and let me, for simplicity, take one of these less complicated systems, uh, which uh, does not have C2 symmetry, like twisted bilayer aligned with HBN or uh, ABC tilayer graphene or something. So this filling include cones both spin and valley. So sometimes people call this quarter filling, half filling, and three-fourths filling, right? Now, so the first statement I want to make is that at, e at these interior fillings, in the strong coupling limit, W much, much smaller than U, that there's a natural ex expectation based on some very simple physical arguments that the ordering, that the ground state is ordered uh, ferromagnetically in the spin valley space. And so you can see that at integer total filling, if you have spin fully polarized spin valley ferromagnetic ordering, you can completely fill a band and form an insulator. Okay. So in the strong coupling limit, uh, th there's a natural insulator which is ferromagnetic, which is ferromagnetic in the spin valley space. Um, so there's an example of what is sometimes called flat band ferromagnetism, but with a mechanism that's slightly different from what's usually discussed in that context. Now, within the spin valley space, this ferromagnetic order parameter can be oriented along different directions and point in the spin direction or in the valley direction or in some combination of both. And which direction it points in is, uh, can be easily decided through a simple Hartley fork calculation. Okay, so that gives you a framework to discuss the ordering in the strong coupling limit. So the question is, why is this statement correct? After all, I started the talk in my primer on correlated electron systems by saying that ferromagnetism is extremely uncommon in insulators. Uh, you know, Phil Anderson's Nobel Prize artifact uh, was based on showing that the antiferromagnetism is the natural result of forming a correlated insulator. Uh, so how is it that we get ferromagnetic coordination here? So to build the argument, let me start with the case where we can make a lattice model where there is no band topology, namely the topologically trivial bands of ABC trilayer graphene on HPN for the sign of the displacement field where the bands are non-topological, there's no churn number. Now, as we saw, uh, the Berry flux density is non-zero, but integrates to zero, right? This is our negative Berry curvature, this positive Berry curvature, and the integral is zero. And I said that a consequence of this is that the Warnier functions that exist, uh, they exist, but they are somewhat fat. Uh, physically speaking, there's an orbital magnetization that comes from this very flux distribution. There's something that has been probed in experiments in recent years and other contexts. So you no, know, once the Warnier function has an orbital angular momentum, you can't squeeze it down to, to something that's very thin, right? Uh, so because these are fat, when you project the Coulomb attraction, uh, even though the Warnier functions at neighboring lattice sites are orthogonal, the Warnier densities overlap. Now once Warnier densities overlap, uh, just like in atomic physics, there'll be an inter-site ferromagnetic Hund's attraction, which is of order the Coulomb attraction U, right? And this is on top of the on-site Hubbard U repulsion that will exist within the same Warnier orbital in this system. So you get two kinds of interactions. One is an on-site Hubbard U, and the other is an inter-site ferromagnetic Hund's interaction. So this then gives you an interaction that's of order U, 
uh, that's ferromagnetic, which will then compete with uh, Anderson super exchange, which is of order T squared over U, uh, which gives you anti-ferromagnetism. But in the strong coupling limit, uh, where the electron hopping T is much, much smaller than U, uh, the Hund's exchange, which is of order U, will always win over the T squared over U. Okay, so this then gives you a, a mechanism for ferromagnetism in a Morton slater. Uh, it's a very phase based mechanism for ferromagnetism in a Morton slater. Uh, as far as I can, I, I couldn't see any discussion of this in the old literature, but maybe I'm wrong. But in any case, this is distinct from uh, this delicate mechanism for ferromagnetism that is well known in magnetism by Grudenoff and Kanemori from 1960, which relies on some subtle cancellation and a 90 degree exchange uh, uh, and a bond, which uh, goes to an exchange path that has a, a 90 degree bond. So there's a weak ferromagnet, while this ferromagnet has the potential to be strong, okay? So we did an explicit calculation to demonstrate this uh, for ABC Tylier graphene on HBN. Uh, so this is the projection of the interacting part of the Hamiltonian to the one year basis. So the details are not, uh, I don't want to emphasize the details here. So these are, there's an on-site Coulomb repulsion, there's a nearest neighbor Coulomb repulsion. But the crucial term is this term that I've circled. Uh, it's, uh, the point is that there's a order U with some coefficient now in this example, uh, so this is an intersite ferromagnetic Hund's interaction. In this example, this coefficient is non-zero, but it turns out to be very small. It's about one percent, but one percent of an electronic repulsion scale is still huge, right? So there's a big tendency for the system to be ferromagnetic, and if you really took the limit of t going to zero, so that the super exchange effect goes to zero, then this the this is the dominant thing that will lift the spin valley degeneracy and will give you a ferromagnet. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, what about plus minus churn bands? You know, that was an illustration for the topologically trivial bands. What if you have a plus minus churn band? You know, a plus minus churn band, it's topological. So it's an extreme case of this uh, fat Vonier function. In fact, Vonier function can be thought of as infinitely fat. It can't be localized at all. So then you expect that the ferromagnetic insulator is slightly only even more stable than it was in this case, in the other case that I just talked about, where you had localized but fat monoyer functions. So this here at quantum hall analogy is actually very helpful. So this uh, you know it's very well known in the quantum hall context that you often get ferromagnetism, a total integer filling. Uh being discussed tremendously in the uh, two dead literature, the Gallimarsnay literature, but also in the quorum hall effect in graphene. So this is very similar to the quorum hall effect uh, in uh, uh, to the ferromagnetism in quorum hall systems, except that it happens in these plus minus churn bands. So based on this uh, expectation and some simple Hartley Fock uh, uh, ideas, you can expect the following things. At half filling, u t equals two, the ferromagnetism because of this weak intervalley Hund's interaction, uh, remember the two valleys are coupled together weakly by Hund's interaction. You might expect the, a spin polarized insulator at half filling, while at ut equals one or three, you expect that the spin valley ferromagnetism is such that it's both spin and valley polarized completely. This then will then completely fill a churn band. You know, you pick one valley or the other to completely polarize. And when you completely fill all the states within that valley, you get a churn band, you get a churn insulator, and then you'll get a quantum anomalous fall effect with the whole conductance of C times E spread over H. Okay, so these are you know simple expectations. Uh, well, you can find these spin valley ferromagnets within a straightforward Hartley Fock calculation, but you know, anyone who's worked on correlated electrons for a while knows that for uh, you know, Hartley Fock is notoriously bad in predicting ferromagnetism, but uh, typically overestimates ferromagnetism. So we can't really trust that Hartley Fock is not biasing us strongly in favor of ferromagnetism. So we have to substantiate these arguments further, not just with Hartley Fock, but further substantiate it uh, with some other calculation. So we resorted to numerics, to numerical calculations. Uh, 
on on reasonably uh, on reasonable system sizes, it turns out that you can uh, just do an exact diagonalization in momentum space of the uh, microscopic Hamiltonian. And this is the work of Cecile Rippelin in uh, when she was supposed to work at MIT. Um, and, you know, exact diagonalization has some limitations due to system size, the size of the Hilbert space one can work with. But within those limitations, evidence was uh, pretty convincing that uh, 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 you do get uh, ferromagnetism uh, in the strong coupling limit. Uh, and she even tested the uh, stability of the ferromagnetism to bandwidth. And uh, uh, so this plot, the vertical axis is the critical bandwidth that's needed to destabilize the ferromagnet. And you see that in a variety of these systems, you go from a few percent to maybe even 20% uh, of the ratio of bandwidth to uh, the Coulomb attraction, you can, you know, have this much bandwidth and still have uh, the spin valley ferromagnet. There's a number of other things in this plot that, uh, that since uh, maybe I, I will not mention, um, uh, but there's no other interesting features. We also did a simple DMRG calculation, but I'm going to skip that as well uh, for lack of time. And instead, uh, uh, just go back to these simple expectations. You know, so these are the most natural expectations, the simple physical arguments, Hartley Fock, and some numerics give you these, lead you to these sorts of expectations. Now, uh, let's now ask about experiment. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so the news from experiments turns sort out of to be uh, quite encouraging. So, the half filled insulator, that it may be a spin polarized insulator, and that uh, so that's the expectation, and that may recently have been discovered in twisted double bilayer graphene, uh, uh, the system that was studied by this group in China, Ch 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 Meng, uh working in Philip Kim's group and Pablo's group. Um, there have been several other experiments since that have been put in references to. These were the first three papers. Uh, uh, so here's a uh, Ming's paper. Uh, uh, at least the this the archive the title from the archive version of the paper. Uh, um, so this again is a dual gated sample. The same. Uh, so the plot is uh, similar to the plot I showed you for ABC trilayer graphene. Uh, actually, one of these is the back gate voltage, and the other is the top gate voltage. Uh, and going along the diagonal changes the displacement field at uh, fixed density, and going in this direction changes the charge density at fixed displacement field. So if you go here, you're doping into the conduction band, and this is neutrality, and this is uh, full filling of the conduction band. So our interest is here at half filling of the conduction band, where you see this highly resistive state driven by this, uh, a displacement field. Uh, at finite displacement field. And in this highly resistive state, uh, 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 so I put, pulled this plot out of Xiaoming's paper. Uh, what's plotted here is the activation gap of this insulator as a function of an in plane magnetic field. Now you can make the case that the in plane magnetic field likely couples only through the Zeeman effect, uh, only couples to spin and to no other degrees of freedom. Uh, so then this in plane, this Activation gap at beyond a certain field uh, more or less increases linearly with this in plane field. And if you look at the slope, the slope is consistent with the Zeeman splitting with a G factor of two. Now that's exactly what you expect if it's a spin polarized insulator. Right? Here, the word ferromagnetic, I'm using it to say that it's spin polarized. So that looks good that uh, new T equals two, if you get an insulator, that it may be spin polarized. At least in twisted double bilayer graphene. Uh, now let's ask about this uh, part of the story that that uh, nu t equals one or three, that you may get a spin valley polarized ferromagnetic insulator with a quantum anomalous fall effect. Uh, and this again, uh, 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 I put a question mark here because I think I made the slide a while back. Uh, uh, I, I'm happy to remove this question mark now, 
or, or maybe I should tell let me let me let me keep it for reasons I could return to in a minute. So this may have been seen uh, both in twisted bilayographene aligned with the boronitride substrate uh, and in the valence band of ABC trileographene uh, uh, aligned with HBN at a total filling of nu t equals one. Okay, uh, so let me show you some of the data. For twisted bilayographene nearly aligned with HBN, there was a first uh, report of ferromagnetism and a normal Hall effect near filling fraction, uh, near three fourths filling of the conduction band uh, in an experiment by Goldhaber Gordon's group. Uh, so they saw hysteresis and transport at three fourths filling. Uh, so this is an, uh, an example of a hysteresis loop in, or in the whole transport. And uh, uh, the rho xy in the high field state uh, corresponds to about half of h over e squared while rho xx was about uh, 0 0.3 h over e squared. So the whole angle is huge, but it's not exactly a quantum anomalous fall effect. So this is the first experiment. And the second experiment, and this is now published uh, in science by Andrea Young's group, um, uh, saw a beautiful quantum anomalous fall effect. Uh, so it, uh, this also was interested by layer aligned with HBN at the same filling. And here's uh, rho xy, this is sub. Uh, 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 to xx. And here again, you see hysteresis, but uh, when you get out of the hysteresis loop, you see a nicely quantized uh, quantum Hall effect with, uh, that's quantized to about one part in 10 to the three. So you do see a quantum anomalous Hall effect in this system. Okay. Now in ABC trilayer graphene uh, aligned with HBN, uh, what's seen is a turn number two quantum anomalous Hall effect. So as far as I know, a turn number two quantum anomalous Hall effect has never been seen in any system before. Uh, that, that there is some suggestion that it may be seen in these magnetic topological insulators and manganese, bismuth, tellurium, and so on. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what extent it's actually been demonstrated. But here you do get a C equals two turn insulator. Uh, and again, to remind you from a, what I said a few slides back, this was the system in which for one sign of D, you get uh, topologically trivial bands, while for the other sign of D, you get topologically non-trivial bands. So if you go to the sign of D where you get topologically non-trivial bands, and then you go to quarter filling, right? So you go in this direction to quarter filling, then uh, this is what you see. So there's a plot, or again, of the whole coefficient uh, as a function of magnetic field. Uh, there's a small hysteresis loop um, uh, but once you exit the hysteresis loop by about 200 uh, millitesla, you get a nicely quantized uh, rho xy, which is quantized to about h over 2e squared. Okay. Uh, so that's the experiment. So the experiments are very encouraging that uh, the simple theoretical expectations based on the strong coupling limit, uh, so uh, or that, that's what's actually going on. Um, so, uh, so to finish off this part of the story, let me mention a number of important open questions. Uh, to what extent do the experiments actually confirm these theoretical expectations? Right? Uh, for these one fourth or three fourth filled ferromagnets, from experiment, what we know for sure so far is that there's valley polarization. You know, that the valley degree of freedom is an icing like degree of freedom. So, you expect hysteresis in a magnetic field as you cycle a magnetic field because it's an icing type degree of freedom. Now the spin degree of freedom is to a, a excellent approximation, fully SU2 symmetric. So the spin ordering, you don't, uh, spin ordering by itself will not give you any hysteresis. So the simplest theory that I've sketched so far, uh, which is based on the strong coupling limit, assumes complete spin and valley polarization. But so far, None of the experiments on any of these systems have actually probed the spin polarization. So from an experimental point of view, we do not know whether the simplest state described by the strong coupling theory is what's actually realized in the experiments or not. Okay. So Dr. Sensu, uh, just to, to interrupt you with a question here from uh, Pavel, why is yeah. Uh, C equal two for ABC trilayer graphene is observed. Isn't uh, C equals three or zero expected? 
<laughs> Very good. Uh, so this was all the footnotes I put in many of the slides. So let me uh, emphasize the footnotes. Um, so it turns out that in this system, uh, it's important to take into account not just the bare band structure, but a renormalization of the band structure that comes from interactions between the active band and the remote band. Uh, this effect, so in the original band structure, so when I initially described the system, I was doing free for me on band theory. And within that theory, you indeed get bands which are number plus minus three. But then there's a hotly fork effect, which comes from interaction between the active band and the remote band, which leads to renormalization of the band structure. Now, when you take that renormalization into account, it turns out that it's possible, depending on details, to get either turn number two or turn number three. So when Feng's group observed, you know, so the way things happened is that we wrote this theory paper saying the bands will have turn number three. We should go look for a quantum anomalous fall effect. So Feng's group went and looked for this effect. They found it, but they found a turn number two. So then they contacted us and my wonderful student, Yohi Zhang, uh, figured out that the, this renormalization of band structure may make it possible. Uh, that's probably why uh, you're in a regime where the turn number is two instead of turn number three. So this effect is not taken into account if you, you know, it's an interaction induced effect. It's, a, it's actually theoretically interesting that interactions change the churn number of a band by renormalizing the band. You're used to interactions renormalizing the dispersion, but they may also renormalize the band topology. Thank you. Yeah, it's a shot. Uh, Right, so in the strong coupling limit, uh, the states you get goes uh, spin and valley pull, right? By strong coupling, I mean zero bandwidth. Now the real life is not at zero bandwidth, rather it's at finite bandwidth. And at finite bandwidth, since all we know is that there's valley polarization, we should be open-minded to the possibility that the spin physics is different. So just to emphasize this with uh, your he, uh, 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 and, uh, we posted a paper recently describing us, you know, some other states that could, that are also consistent with, with the current set of experiments. For instance, you could have valley polarization, a valley ferromagnet, but a spin antiferromagnet. So we'll call this a quantum hall antiferromagnet. You know, that would be as consistent with the existing experiments as uh, uh, this completely spin and valley polarized state. Then even more exotic possibility is that the valley is polarized into a uniform ferromagnet, but the spin is actually in a quantum spin liquid state. So we call this a quantum hall spin liquid. So I like this because it has all the buzzwords of modern condensed matter physics within the same state of matter, right? Uh, but you know, this state would also be consistent with the existing experiments. So it's really up to future experiments to somehow get a way to probe the spin physics of the systems that are showing the quantum anomalous all effect. Now, uh, in the literature, in the recent literature, there are even more exotic proposals that are very interesting, but exotic proposals that other people have made, uh, which are states that are not even fully valley polarized, uh, but where the valley polarization is partial. And uh, this partial valley polarization is enabled by the formation of intervalley excitons, which themselves move in a churn band. So these authors, uh, these two more or less simultaneous papers, they propose uh, very exotic, but uh, interesting Laughlin states of these excitons as things that may be going on in this system. Uh, but in any case, there's a bunch of other possibilities for what's going on, which is not the simplest hotly fork or strong coupling state. And it's really up to future experiments to decide uh, you know, somehow I think it's really important to develop a probe of spin physics in the system or, or in other Moria graphene systems to, uh, to settle this issue of what, what the spin is doing. Okay. Um, uh, screen seems to have shut down. Ah, yeah. So let me 
mention a little bit about some future opportunities in these plus minus churn band systems. Now, since with the displacement tree, you can tune the bandwidth, right? Uh, in the limit of narrow bandwidth, you get a churn insulator. Uh, but as you tune the displacement field, you increase the bandwidth. And at some point, you're going to end up with a Fermi liquid. So how does this evolution happen between a Fermi liquid and a churn insulator? Right? This, you know, in the past, this would have been a theorist question. But now, you know, this, I think, within the realm of experimental feasibility to address this kind of question. And already in the ZBC tile layer system, uh, in Feng and goldhaber gordons data, as you tune the displacement field, you go from a metal to a churn insulator, right? Now, what happens as you dope away from integer total filling? That's something else that can be studied. Now, we looked at this theoretically, and particularly we were looking for a fractional churn insulator phase in twisted bilayer graphene aligned with HBN uh, in the range of fillings where it's known experimentally that this valley polarization. And at five, six fillings, according to our numerics, it should be possible to get a fractional churn insulator phase. Um, there's also related papers by Burgos and company and by Patrick Lidwith and, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, and Ashwin Vishnath, uh, uh, which also discuss these fractional churn insulator phases. So I think there's a good possibility of realizing fractional churn insulators in this system. Uh, there are various other interesting issues, even on the topologically trivial side, uh, to be discussed experimentally. But I see that I have less than 10 minutes left, so let me move on. Um, uh, so this is a summary of this portion of the talk. Uh, because many of you probably have heard a lot more about twisted bilayer graphene than about these other Moiré systems, I want to finish the talk by saying a few things about twisted bilayer graphene. Um, I would have time to say everything that I prepared slides for, that's okay. Uh, so specifically, uh, let me skip the band theory part. Um, uh, actually, let me skip all of this. I just want to go towards, uh, let me skip this completely. Uh, yeah, so let's, uh, um, so I mostly avoided talking about the band topology or the band structure of twisted bilayer graphene other than to say that it has direct connections uh, and that uh, there is this notion of fragile topology. Now let me describe uh, a, a simplified model for uh, twisted bilayer graphene, which uh, seems to be a useful model. So the bits it's a magdanol model couples together electrons in the two graphene layers. Now there's two, uh, uh, parameters in this model. One is the same sublattice center layer of hopping, uh, which is denoted W naught. And the other is an opposite sublattice center layer of hopping that's denoted W1. And the original bits of the Magnol model, uh, they, for for, uh, you know, they made the simplifying assumption that W naught is equal to W1. Now in real devices, it turns out that there's a corrugation of the bilayer the AA regions are a bit further away from each other uh, uh, than the AB or BA regions. And this leads to a reduction of W0 relative to W1. And it's estimated to be about 0.7 to 0.8. And this, in fact, narrows the bands a little bit more and separates them out from the remote bands a bit more. Now, uh, in this work, uh, which is very interesting by Tarnopoulosky et al., they made a an extreme, I, uh, they took an extreme limit where W0 or W1 was set to exactly zero. So there's the so-called chiral limit where the hopping is entirely opposite sublattice hopping. And in this limit at magic angles, the what they found is that the bands are exactly flat. There's even this narrow bandwidth is exactly set to zero. And for each valley, uh, so if you focus on a single valley and a single spin, then there are two flat bands corresponding to the valence and conduction bands. And these two flat bands are exactly degenerate. They're completely flat. And they have opposite churn number plus minus one. So here within a single valley, uh, uh, there is a basis for these two uh, degenerate flat bands, which is such that th these two flat bands, one of them has churn number plus one, and the other has churn number minus one. And physically, it turns out that these two correspond to wave functions 
that are either localized on the A or B subplanets. And furthermore, the Berry curvature of these churn bands is more or less flat. So in this chiral limit, there's a useful strategy for approaching the twisted bilayer-graphene problem, which is to start with this chiral limit, uh, including spin and valley, we then have, uh, it's almost like a set of eight lander levels, of which four are in a, in a plus B magnetic field and the other four are in a minus B magnetic field. So then, uh, at least in this chiral limit, the problem reduces to the same kind of problem that I was talking about earlier with plus minus churn bands, just that you have more of them, right? Then for the same reasons, uh, a total integer fill-in, if you now turn on interactions, you expect quantum Hall-like ferromagnetism in the spin valley sublattice space with selection determined by the details of interactions. So this was worked out in this uh, paper uh, by Mike Zelatel and Ashwin and their collaborators. And that even in TGO filling, they find a particular intervalley coherent state that spontaneously breaks the valley U1 symmetry. And the hope is that this limit where the problem is can be handled somewhat uh, uh, gives us a good starting point to build intuition on what happens at realistic W0 over W1. I think as a theoretical approach to twisted barrier graphene, this seems like a very sensible, promising approach, but it remains to be seen uh, uh, how much this hope is actually realized. But at least it incorporates a lot of the right elements of the problem. This is what I meant by saying earlier that starting with quantum hall intuition is probably uh, uh, less misleading than doing anything else. Um, I have a few slides prepared on the phenomenology, uh, which I'm mostly going to skip uh, unless someone wants me to say something. Um, but maybe I'll just say one thing about the phenomenology. Um, um, let me just say one thing and then I'll stop. I have one minute, so let me just say that one thing. So large number of experiments that have probed the phase diagram. This is a very, very schematic phase diagram. Um, this neutrality, these are the correlated, the prominent correlated insulators at plus minus two. And this is the correlated insulator and the superinquity on either side. Now, there's one message from experiment that I want to emphasize simply because it's not often emphasized, which is that there's a variety of uh, you know, experiments that show that the superconductor, that the normal metallic state on the side on the in the in the metal that you get by doping away from the from charge neutrality uh, has a small Fermi surface where the carrier density is set by this doping delta. And furthermore, by studying uh, Lando levels, studying the Lando fans, uh, in you know all the different experimental groups reach the same conclusion that you lose half of the spin valley quantum numbers when you go to minus two minus delta. And this should be contrasted with what the experiments tell us. Again, experiments by all the groups tell us at minus two plus delta if you park here and go towards neutrality. There, everybody agrees that you have a large Fermi surface where the carrier density is determined by the deviation from neutrality, and furthermore, that you preserve spin valley symmetry. Okay, so this means that the normal states on either side of the correlated insulator are strikingly different. Okay, uh, so that is quite an ambiguous from experiments, right? So I want to just leave you with this following thought. If the normal states are so completely different, you know, why should we expect the superconductors that you get are exactly the same? Perhaps these superconductors are also completely different. Maybe they arise through different mechanisms, right? So you know, there's often a question that's asked, what's the mechanism for superconductivity? But maybe they're just, there's different mechanisms operating in different density ranges. But maybe it's more than just a difference in mechanism. Maybe they're even completely different. They're sharply distinct phases of matter. Maybe they have different pairing symmetry, right? So I, I think, I don't think we know the answers to any of these questions, but I think it should be kept in mind that we should be open to the possibility that all the superconductors that are seen at different densities uh, in the same device may not be the same superconductor, right? So then the question 
it, I think it's an open experimental question as to whether they are the same or whether they're different. So let me just summarize by saying that there's all kinds of interesting things going on. Um, uh, so I have a wish list for experiment. Since the majority of the slight majority of you are experimentalists, uh, uh, perhaps one thing that I want to really emphasize in this wish list is one thing that would be great to have is a probe of diamagnetism in such a 2D supernova. Right? There's a lot of discussion on whether supernovae is actually seen in some of these systems. Interested double bilayer graphene and ABC trilayer graphene. Is it ballistic transport? Is it really superconductivity? You know, before we can answer questions about pairing symmetries in all these systems, we should be able to answer the question of is it really a symmetry? Right? So I'm looking forward to some clever experimentalists figuring out how to measure diamagnetism or do some Josephson experiment in this, in this kind of system. So let me stop there. Uh, so let's uh, thank uh, Professor Sansio for the very interesting talks and uh, we'll proceed to questions. Uh, the first question is uh, from Pavel. Uh, how does the topological transition occur when charging, when changing displacement field in trailer graphing on HBN? Are uh, there additional zero energy modes at the transition? Yes, that there is. And now in real life, the band vector is a is more complicated than in the simplified model that I showed. Um, let's see. Um, and so in real life, you go through a metric. Okay. Uh, or, or you, you know, you go through some complicated evolution. Now, uh, if you make a better model than the simplified model that I made, you will see all kinds of intermediate phases that appear. There's no direct transition uh, between turn number zero and turn number three, but uh, uh, there's a bunch of phases that uh, um, appear in between. That, maybe that's all I should say about this. Thank you. Uh, next question from Jonathan. Uh, why are the Vimeer wave functions strongly non-localized for topological non-trivial bands? Oh, so that's the point that I made in the previous lecture. So in the, uh, let's take the example of the churn band. Um, right? So in the churn band, uh, there is this theorem that I didn't give you a proof for, but I gave you the intuition behind it that since the phase of the block wave function cannot be globally defined, when you try to do the integral to define the one-year function, you, you cannot get exponentially localized one-year functions. Uh, now, you know, a, a turn bank does not have localized one-year functions, right? Now, the topological band, the symmetry predicted topological band, the example that I gave you is so plus minus turn bands where uh, to define symmetric one year functions, yeah, you can't define symmetric localized one year functions. You can define localized one year functions, but then the symmetry action becomes complicated, uh, non manifest. And that's a dangerous thing to do. The next question uh, you choose the analogy between ferromagnetic insulator in the chain brand and quantum Hall ferromagnetism. Do we expect mm -hmm. the same uh, analogy for their fractional counterparts? If yes, which Mori system, twisted bilayer graphing ABC, ABC, ABC trailer, uh, twisted double bilayer graphing, or twisted bilayer monolayer graphing appearing to, appears the most promising to you for observing this? Well, for observing the fractional churn and slivers? That's, that's right. right. Yeah, so I had a slide on that. Unfortunately, my thing seems to be getting stuck right now. Uh, not sure what's going on. But uh, uh, as things stand, the most promising system to see a fractional churn and slater, uh seems to be twisted bilayer graphene aligned with HBN at a filling of 5 over 6 in the conduction band. Um, so the experiments. The existing experiments see hysteresis uh, in the uh, whole transport as a function of perpendicular magnetic field 
in a range of fillings that includes this filling. So this is an indication that there's valley polarization already in this system. Now, numerically, when the uh, repellent looked at this uh, uh, models of this system uh, uh, to a exact diagonalization, we did find uh, a fractional churn insulator ground state, uh, which was, whether it's spin polarized, it's valley polarized by assumption, but whether it's spin polarized or not, it's a delicate question that depends on the details of the band structure. In particular, it depends very sensitively on this parameter W0 over W1. Uh, but yeah, so this corresponds in the quantum hall analogy to two thirds filling of land level, where in, in gallimarsenide, uh, at small Zeeman fields, that's known to be a spin unpolarized state. Uh, here, it turns out that in the presence of very curvature fluctuations, it may be spin unpolarized even at zero Zeeman field. But in any case, uh, that seems to be the best. Uh, the question was, where, where do I expect? So to me, that seems to be the most promising place to look for a fractional churn insulator as of now. So we'll, uh, just follow up with one of my own question. Uh, what, what do you think we need to do beyond current experiments to realize such a fractional churn insulator? Do we need better cleaner samples? Or like, uh, what do you think what's lacking? Professor? Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, the existing experiments, uh, I, I don't know, the data may have changed by now. Uh, 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 experiment bandage on, uh, on quantum anomalous, the picture to which he reported right, data. Professor Tansi, your voice was breaking up. Uh, could you repeat? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, uh, actually, let me try the following thing. Um, let me unmute this. Can you hear me better now? Uh, you're twice, uh, that's like resonating. <laughs> um, yeah, is this better? Uh, I still hear the echo. Yeah, so... Uh, let me try one more thing. Uh, all right, is this better? Can you hear me yeah, now? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, so it's answering the question of what needs to be done differently, right? Uh, uh, yeah, so let me. So the first thing I wanted to say was that in the uh, data reported by Andrea Young in his published paper, it went down in, on the quantum anomalous Hall effect. The data went down to about one and a half Kelvin. Mm -hmm. right? uh, now, in the range uh, at filling 5.6, where there, there is some hope of seeing a fractional turn in uh, you know, the, uh, um, it, the first thing that I would request experimentalists to do is to study this system at 5.6 filling at lower temperature. Okay. Right? Now, uh, where at 3 fourths filling, where the, quantum anomaly, the integer quantum anomalous fall effect is seen, the gap is quite big. The activation gap is about 25 Kelvin. Now, of course, fractional quantum hole gaps are likely to be smaller than integer quantum hole gaps. Right? So, but uh, you know, in the ED that we did, the estimate that we obtained of the gap was uh, uh, not too small. It was on the, I forget the number now, but it was within, it was on the few Kelvin scale. It was within the reach of experiments. But, you know, we don't know the microscopics well enough to give you a completely accurate number uh, of what the gap is going to be. Right? So that may be the first thing that uh, maybe it's already there in existing devices if you just cool it down. Right? Uh, now, the second thing that one could try to do is, as far as I understand from talking to both Goldarbor Gordon, uh, talking to Goldarbor Gordon and Andrea Young on twisted bilayer lines with HBN, 
in both of their labs, this alignment happened by accident. Okay. Uh, now, now, if you carefully study the problem of uh, twisted bilayer nearly aligned with boron nitride, there are certain specific angles, not, you know, if you nearly align, there are certain nice alignment angles at which you get a nicer band structure than at other angles. Um, so there are certain angles at which this entire phenomenon may be amplified, right? So maybe try to target yeah, those. Think, uh, perfectly aligned is not the best scenario, but like some small. Yeah, exactly. So it turns out that zero degree alignment is not the best place, but rather some small, there is there are specific but small twist angles between the uh, uh, twisted bilayer and the HBN substrate, which may be ideally suited uh, to, to, to seeing these effects. Um, yeah. Thank so, you know, it's the difference between accidentally hitting some angle close to zero versus trying to engineer that in some more rational manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the next precaution is uh, will the low energy excitations, uh, such as spin waves, uh, be different depending on whether the spin is polarized or not? I mean, will this uh, result in a potential, potentially observable effect in the experiment? Yeah, no. Uh, if you have spontaneous spin ferromagnetism, you would certainly have uh, spin waves, which, uh, you know, for all practice, will be almost quadratically dispersing except for some weak spin orbit effects. Um, and if you didn't have, if it were a spin singlet state with a spin gap, you obviously would not have that spin wave branch at low energies. Now, the question really is uh, how will you probe that in an experiment, right? In this uh, 2D material. Um, I don't know, but I hope that one of the experimentalists listening in can devise a way to probe the spin excitations. I see, thanks. Um, the next question, can you elaborate the interest in the uh, evolution from Fermi liquid to churn insider? What can be expected? Okay, good. That's a great question because uh, the really honest answer is I don't know, but since the question was what not what will happen, but what I may expect. Let me speculate on this. Uh, by analogy, with a much simpler problem, which is, uh, say, the evolution in a non-topological band from a Morton's later to a Fermi liquid, right? I started my talk by saying that it's precisely in the vicinity of the Mort transition that all kinds of weird things happen. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I, you know, I described HTC superconductivity, but another thing that happens already on the Morton slating side is that this seems to be one of the best places to look for a quantum spin liquid, right? A weak Morton slater. And uh, I, I didn't have an opportunity to listen to Leon Balance's talks. I guess he's only given one talk so far, and he might have mentioned this, but there are a number of experiments on what we call the 2D organics and other systems which show that in root, you know, as you evolve from a Morton slater to a Fermi liquid, you stabilize a quantum spin liquid. Uh, at least in the lattice is not bipartite and so on. So with that, as uh, with that insight, you know, what weird insulators uh, might we expect as we leave the flat band churn insulator and start introducing some kinetic energy into the problem, right? We may get all kinds of uh, interesting insulators that cannot be stabilized in the flat band limit, right? Uh, in the quantum hall literature, there's a lot of discussions of very weird states of matter that require, you know, three body interactions, things of that sort. Perhaps those things will be stabilized if you give the system a little bit of kinetic energy, but not so much that it becomes metallic. Now coming from the metallic side, you know, what's the nature of the phase transition? You know, is, what's the nature of the metal insulator transition that you get? You know, it's a metal to some correlated insulator transition. Right? What happens to the Fermi surface? Does it disappear all in one shot? 
Does it, does it you know, is there, is there a first order transition? What really happens? So all of those things are questions for which nobody knows the answer. Um, and know that it may be possible to probe this in experiments. Maybe we should all collectively as a theoretical community try to figure out the answers. Thank you. Uh, Jia Chen asks, could you provide some intuition why a line HBN lead to valley polarization? Are there connections between sublattice density of sublattice degree, degree of freedoms and valley degree of freedoms in twisted better graphing, like the case of new equals zero nano level in graphing? Oh, okay, good. Uh, uh, yeah, so the first part of the question was uh, whether I could provide intuition on why alignment with HBN leads to valley polarization. Right, good. So let me try to do that. Uh, so when you align with HBN, uh, so before you align with HBN, the valence and conduction bands are connected to the dot points. So that, that's the standard twisted by the graphene. Now, when you align with HBN, you uh, split off the valence band from the conduction band, and this results in somewhat narrower bands, right? So now you only have the valence band to deal with. You don't have to worry about uh, the valence band talking to the conduction band, right? Um, so, uh, so this narrow band, uh, and furthermore, this, this narrow band also has uh, plus minus churn number. So the combination of all these things leads to the possibility of, uh, at least in the strong coupling limit, of spin valley ferromagnetism, uh, which then gives you uh, this valley polarization. Okay. Now, uh, for twisted barrier graphene itself, the, without the alignment, the story is uh, more complicated. Uh, precisely because you have this band touching uh, between the valence and conduction bands. So apart from the spin and valley degree of freedom, you also have a sublattice degree of freedom, right? Or if you wish, a layer degree of freedom, right? And it's better to think of it as a sublattice degree of freedom. So really you have eight degrees of freedom instead of four, and the band is not flat. Now in this chiral limit that uh, Tarnopolsky et al. described, uh, that at least in the artificial limit, the bands do become exactly flat. And uh, within this basis in which uh, for each spin in each valley, it's possible to go to a basis which is sublattice resolved. And that sublattice resolved basis has non-zero plus minus churn numbers. Uh, but these do not, are not associated with the two distinct valleys. The two distinct valleys, the level of band structure, really do not talk to each other. Rather, the sublattice polarization is associated with different churn numbers within the same value. Okay, thank you. Uh, two questions about ABC trial error. First, mm -hmm. can you explain a little bit uh, why delta C equals plus minus three with opposite D signs? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can answer that first and then we'll read a second. So, so the question was, uh, what, let me see if I can move my, uh, so the question was about the, why the two different signs of opposite turn number, right? The, uh, yeah, I have a delta C equals plus minus three. Right, so it's because the very curvature, uh, before you turn on the, um, uh, the Moyer potential, uh, the Bayes curvature is, uh, uh, you know, because the cubic band touching, right? Uh, the phase winds by three pi as you go around the cubic band touching, you know, it's kx minus i k y cubed. So for monolayer graphene, it's kx minus i k y and the phase winds by pi. For bilayer graphene, it's kx minus i k y squared and phase winds by two pi. Here it winds by three pi. So once you introduce this, uh, uh, potential between the top and bottom layer, this MA, you gap out this band touching points, but then you shift this three pi very curvature to one side, okay? Um, uh, so it's spread out and uh, so this extra three pi very curvature, which, you know, 
combines with, so the change of the very curvature when you go from one sign to the other sign is six pi, right? Because it's plus three pi for one sign and minus three pi for the other sign. So there's a change of six pi, which corresponds to a change of churn number of, uh, you know, it's three times two pi. The change of churn number is three. I see. So the second question is uh, in the Hamiltonian shown, why is there, why is only the bottom and top layer taken into account, but not the middle layer? Good, very good. Um, so, um, let me go back to this picture. So the point is that, uh, so, so here in this structure, uh, each layer is AB stacked with respect to the two layers that it's adjacent to. So, so this picture is maybe more useful. So the electron in the B side of the first layer is strongly hybridized with the electron on the A side of the second layer. Uh, and of course, it's hybridized with the, the A side electron of the second layer. It's hybridized with the B side electron of the second layer. And this in turn is strongly hybridized with the A side electron of the third layer. So because this, so this means that in the intermediate layer, uh, the electrons are strongly hybridized with the electrons in either the bottom or the top layer, right? So in effect, you can integrate out this intermediate layer out and focus just on the electrons in the bottom or top layer, right? They, you know, the wave functions of the electrons, the top or bottom or top layer, uh, they contain the information about the wave functions of electrons in this intermediate layer. Uh, that the intermediate layers are slave to either the top or bottom layers. So you, don't, you can forget about them in the low energy approximation. Yeah. Uh, next question from Joshua. Uh, is the weakly interacting Fermi liquid phase of ABC uh, trailer graphing a ferromagnetic Fermi liquid? Uh, example before the evolution into a train system. Oh, and the weak coupling limit, uh, I mean, certainly experimentally, it's not a ferromagnet. It's, it's not a value ferromagnet, at least. Um, now, theoretically, um, it, 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 no, yeah, theoretically, it's not a value ferromagnet either. You know, there's no reason to it. Uh, for arbitrary, in the control limit of arbitrarily weak interactions, there is no reason to expect uh, ferromagnetism. Right. Well, the Fermi liquid will just be stable. Right. There's no, uh, uh, you know, weak coupling Fermi liquid theory is usually stable, except perhaps for you know we can forget about supergen activity. Right. Uh, if you the the only time you get an instability in the weak coupling limit in a Fermi liquid is this, this perfect nesting or something that gives you density wave instabilities. So here there is no such perfect nesting at this filling. Right? So the Fermi liquid is just stable. A paramagnet or symmetry preserving Fermi liquid state is the ground state, except for something like corn letting the super activity, which you don't, you're not really interested in here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is uh, asked by transfer stage uh, desktop. I wonder which lab's transfer stage is this. Uh, how could you reconcile this idea that the supercardic so the superconducting state on either side of uh, nu equals minus two might be strikingly different with the observation from Aftoff's group of what seems to be a continuous superconducting dome that uh, surrounds nu equals plus two in one of his device without the insider. Oh, so the question is about Aftoff's recent experiment um, where there is no insulator, is that correct? Yeah, I think it, there is like super kind of dome that goes across half feeling without inserting stay in the in the middle. All right, very good. Uh, that's an entire can of worms altogether. Uh, those are very interesting experiments, but uh, you know those devices are of course uh, you know modified from the twisted bilayer devices that other people have been working with, and if Tom himself had worked with before, in a manner which is uh, different. Right, there is a thin boron nitrate substrate that separates it from a metallic gate. So again, the question that one can ask is, uh, is the normal state changed? And the answer 
quite unambiguously is that uh, in Nefetov's new device, the normal state is different from the normal state in both his and other people's previous devices. You know, so the normal state is different, if the Lando fan is different, if the charge carrier density is different, then why should the superconducting state also not be different? Right? So, you know, everything else has changed. Why should this one property not be the only thing that has not changed? Or maybe there are too many negatives there, right? I think the jury is out, right? It's it's uh, yeah. I think you know other things have changed. So similarly, may also have changed by the time you go in the, in Efitov's particular device where the HPN is only seven whatever seven and a half nanometers thick. That device may be showing us different phenomena. Uh, I'm not saying that it is, but I think it's important to keep an open mind. Okay, thank you. Uh, last, next question is very specific. Uh, what's the condition for this special HB and alignment angle? I forgot the, uh, I, I don't remember this by heart. Uh, you know, my student has worked this out. Uh, if I remember right, it's, 0.5 degrees or 0.6 degrees. I forget now, but it's very simple to work it out. And uh, uh, my student, Dan Moore, has worked this out in some detail. Um, that, sorry, I don't remember the exact angle. We'll, mm -hmm. that, we will write a paper fairly soon where this will be described. I see. Uh, okay, next question. From again, uh, do you expect a BCS type uh, superconducting state? <laughs> do I expect a BCS type superconducting state? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I don't know what you mean by BCS. Uh, maybe, maybe let me throw it back to you, but who asked the question? What do you mean by BCS? <laughs> Well, if you wish, you wish to talk to Professor Sands, you can raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Uh, wait. Actually, I'm no longer a co-host. Can someone uh, log in to talk? Am I co-host? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I know that um, Phillips. Philip Phillips developed this like generalized BCS model for say systems with a Luttinger surface. So I was wondering, and it's sort of like BCS like, so I was wondering if something similar would be seen in this material. Okay, I don't know anything about that. So uh, I, I, yeah, I'm aware that some such thing exists, but unfortunately I've not had an opportunity to study his model. Uh, so, so, okay, good. So that, Deletes me from the task of answering whether I expect non BCS because it depended. Because non BCS means different things to different people. And depending on what you meant, I would have given an answer. But since what you meant is not it's something I know anything about, I, will, I don't need to, I, I, I'm not in a position to answer that question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the last question, which I saved to the end because I didn't understand it. Um, is the observation of churn number larger than one band important? Uh, what is different from churn equals one band? Does that question make sense to you? Or? It, it does make sense because uh, I emphasize that this may well be the first time that a churn two insulator, that a quantum anomalous hall effect, mm. or I mean, uh, almost a quantum anomalous hall of 15, a 200 milli tesla field is seen with churn two. So why is that interesting, right? Uh, as opposed to uh, uh, churn one. Uh, you know, to me, one of the main interests is in what happens when you dope this, right? And try to look for a potential traction, you know. Uh, so what happens when you dope a churn two and say, it's now you, if you, if the value polarization survives in some range of uh, doping. So then 
you're looking at a system where you partially filled a churn two band, right? So what kind of quantum hall like physics might you expect in a partially filled band with higher churn number, right? So that's a fascinating theoretical question. And it's something that, uh, you know, people have paid a little bit of attention to in the fractional churn and Slater literature in the last many years. But if, you know, this experimental context, you know, experiments will always surprise us, right? So what fascinating things can happen in a partially filled churn two band, right? For a churn one band, we have some reasonable expectation that it's going to be like a single lander level, perhaps if the Berry curvature is reasonably flat, but for a churn two band, People have tried to model it as a pair of lander levels. Is that model, how good is that model really? Uh, so the questions of that sort, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you again, Professor Sansio and all the people who ask questions and we'll proceed to our poster session. Uh,